Good evening. Welcome to the African American Advisory Council for the City of Hollywood's Black History Month celebration. We hope to have a good time tonight. Did everyone enjoy the food in the lobby presented by New Jerusalem Baptist Church? We thank you very much. Now I would like for everyone to stand for the presentation of the colors by the Hollywood Hills Color Guard and remain standing during the national anthem. Thank you. Present to you the singing of the national anthem by Miss Jackie Washington. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts rewatch were so Please remain standing while the color guard exits. Okay, I'm going to introduce to you tonight's panel. It's going to give you an opportunity to honor these veterans, and while at the same time we get a question and answer period to find out what on, went on during their service time. You can have a seat now, by the way. <laughs> he served in the U.S. Army from 1969 to 1979. He completed a tour in Vietnam as a combat infantry soldier. After completing his military duty while attending FIU, he earned a bachelor's degree in psychology. I'd like to introduce to you Sergeant Robert White. He 
He served in the 25th Entry Division of the uh, 3rd Brigade Task Force in Vietnam. While in harm's way, specifically on a search and destroy mission, Brinson was wounded and awarded Distinguished Purple Heart Medal. I introduce to you Sergeant Willie Brinson. He was born in Columbia, Georgia. He came to Miami, Florida in 1952 at the age of eight. He grew up in Liberty City and graduated from Miami Northwestern. He was drafted into the United States Army after he graduated, but volunteered for the United States Marine Corps. I introduce to you, Willie Ferguson. A native of Texas, he joined the U.S. Army as a second lieutenant after receiving a bachelor's degree from Texas Southern University. Okay, I like that. I went to Prairie View. He served 20 years, including two tours in Vietnam. He was awarded numerous commendations for his service, including the Combat Medal Badge, Bronze Star, Oak Leaf Cluster, Cluster and Meritorious Service Award. I introduce to you Mr. Charles James. He is a U.S. Army combat veteran of Operation Just Cause, Operation Desert Storm, and Desert Shield in the Persian Gulf. He's also the commander of the VFW 8195. Introduced to you, Sergeant William Frazier. She is a decorated war veteran and founding member of M.D. Stewart and Associates a business development public relations marketing firm. She's a managing partner of MD Stewart Development Group and Workforce Diversity Recruitment and Consulting. I introduce to you, Dr. Maya Burt Stewart. <laughs> Born and raised in Miami, Florida, he attended Catholic schools and Miami North Day Junior Senior High School. In 1966, he joined the U.S. Marines. He served 13 months in Vietnam as a machine gunner. He returned home in 1970 and joined the Florida National Guard. I introduce to you Sergeant Major Arthur Wells. She's the U.S. Army's first African-American combat intelligence aviator who served during Grenada Panama invasions. She served three tours in Korea during the ongoing Korean conflict and is also a Desert Storm veteran. I would like to introduce to you Dr. Sheila Chamberlain. She has distinguished herself as a selfless and passionate individual by volunteering for many organizations and many venues in Broward County. This has been a lifestyle as she has volunteered at the Philadelphia VA Hospital during her senior year at West Philadelphia High School. Upon graduating from high school, she spent a year in New Jersey while waiting her 18th birthday and induction into the U.S. Air Force. I introduce to you Loretta Long, Young. Can you please stand and give me a hand of applause for our honored panelists and veterans. So next on our agenda, the VFW today has written a book. What's the name of that book, Mr. White? Yes, sir. So these soldiers would like to read excerpts from that book as a presentation before we start our panel discussion. Is that okay with you guys? All right, we're gonna get started with that. We have to set it first, or well, just a second.
check one, two. Good evening. And thank you very much for inviting us out here. We really appreciate this opportunity. Before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge some of the other um, authors of the book, Black Soldiers Tell Their Vietnam Stories. I would like for them to stand, the other authors who were not on the panel. The guy over there with the hat, would you stand who, right there? Uh, now, his name is Clyde Akbar. He's on the picture of the front of this book. If you can show me his picture, I'll give you a book free. <laughs> Other than that, we are selling the books here. And Joy is in the back. Raise your hand. So if any of you all want to purchase this book, we'd appreciate that. Black Soldiers Tell Their Vietnam Stories started about three years ago as a therapy group. Many of us sat around at the VFW in our military outreach center where we provide services to our veterans, particularly PTSD services. Those men and women who are, who are suffering from post-traumatic stress we sat around and talked about those feelings, those anxieties, those nightmares, and those flashbacks. And in doing that, we found that we had a lot of stories to listen to. In telling those stories, we went through a lot of pain, a lot of laughter, a lot of sadness. But we worked our way through it. And in doing so, we decided that we need to tell our stories to our, our posts, most first of all, and to the community, and hopefully, at one day, to the world. This is history from the black perspective. I want to begin by sharing a little bit of my chapter with you. Bobby White stories and untold truths. One of the most relieving and uplifting experiences is what I would like to share first. In Vietnam, the African American soldier had a brotherhood, a type of black unity exercise like I had never seen it in my short time. The DAP was something special every black soldier in Vietnam experienced and practiced. It was a symbol, a ritual of African American unity. It re revitalized interest, handshake, using many gestures, it was a way that the black greeted each other before engaging in conversation. It was an expression of racial solidarity, and much more than that, and much more than a simple handshake, it was a way and a belief that a spiritual way in connecting with our universal language, the African American culture. The word is modified of a word deep, which was in the Vietnam, the Vietnamese slang for something beautiful. The DAP empowered us with a spirit of no fear, pride, unity, status, and an underlying support of each other. All positive, sustaining emotions under the umbrella of the DAP. In short, the DAP brought out the fire in us as black men in the Vietnam experience, we felt something special. White soldiers, as well as the Vietnamese, watched us in amazement as we went through the rituals of the DAP. 
to explain that, it's basically a handshake with many different touches. Before we engage in conversation with any African-American veteran, you had to stand in line to give each and every one of those soldiers the dap. Short story, mission dap. I was involved in a mission that I should never forget. In fact, I recall it as absolute clarity. Because of its importance that I not forget it, I had labeled it Mission DAP. It had been, I had been in Vietnam for six months. And during that time, I experienced so much combat, seen so many deaths. I was walking point on a mission. My entire company was behind me, including my commanding officer. The terrain was unfriendly and tough. I had to use my M16 to cut through the, the dense and thick patches of brush with my weapon. I accidentally fell into an area that was perfectly designed for an ambush. While on one knee, I looked up and saw a Vietnamese who was wearing a black military attire with an AK-47 in his hand pointing in my direction. Before I could gather myself and come to grips with the emotions of the moment, he pointed at me and yelled, Soul Brother, number one GI. He fired his weapon into the air seven times. He slowly turned his back to me and walked into the bushes. While watching him fade away, I then also fired my weapon several times in the air. But that was after he had gone. That experience was captivating. He could easily have killed me. Why he did not, I do not know. All I could think about at the time and saying, thank you, Jesus, was that he might have saw a fellow black soldier giving another the dap, saw our love for each other. That day, the traumatic experience that could have resulted in the loss of life, mine, changed the way I thought about the Vietnam War and the people of that country. I had never, I had a huge conflict to deal with. My black heritage has saved my life. To this day, I still believe that there are many African American veterans who were in similar positions, who had life saving experiences and outcomes that mirrored mine. Humble strengths, a pilot's contribution. Captain Frank Connery, E-8, United States Air Force, Nang Trang, Frank Rang, Vietnam, 1966-1967. Two-minute reading. Good afternoon. Just bear with me one minute. Caught me by surprise. <laughs> by surprise.
<clears throat> Just to give you a little over, oversight, um, in the, my chapter, you'll find that I made mention to a, a drop and popping up. Basically, what it is is you fly low. <clears throat> you fly so low that you can't drop because if you do, or you parachute, your cargo will go into the trees. So what you do, you fly low, pop up, drop your cargo, and then pop down again. The special forces that were lucky enough to be stationed close to a mountain had to be also be supplied. <clears throat> the reality required that we airdrop supplies and food to them, but we, what we found that when approached the sites to drop the air to do the airdrop, we were getting shot up pretty bad. This was occurring because the VC, the enemy, could hear us coming and be ready to find us. We couldn't fly very high because the wind would blow the parachutes to supply food, drop off target. I knew that Charlie would love to get his hands on our drop. So it was decided that we would fly real low, pop up just before, before making the drops. The risk and potential loss of life for pilots became greater because the VC could hear us coming. So we would fly very low, close to the trees, sometimes striking them as we flew. When we arrived right over the base, we would pop up, gain altitude, and use the extraction chute to pull the chutes out of the aircraft with the main chute opening up and landing supplies, hopefully, on the Special Forces campground. After the drop, we could continue climbing until the safe and high altitude was reached. If there were five fights at the Special Forces, we would have to fly very low over the runway while using an extraction chute and drop large blocks of ice 10 to 12 feet so that the dead could be placed on them until we could land and pick them up and take them to Saigon to the morgue. On many fights, we could see the enemy the vehicle running through the jungle shooting at us. Our plane got hit many times. I remember one night we picked up a, lot, a load of armored troops. The fear in the eyes was so intense that it made one sick. I finally got to speak with one who said that they had not slept. So I had a shower or anything cold to drink for weeks. Before we landed to pick them up, we opened the back door for them to enter, and on final, you could hear the VC shooting at us running towards the airport. On one pickup, I had more than 30 bodies on our airplane alone. They had been lying on ice for several days and weeks before there was no refrigeration. After spending one hour in flight and sometimes more flying to get to the morgue, the smell of death and the decaying bodies became so strong inside the airplane that everyone on board would become sick. In efforts to get relief from the smelly situation, we would open the cargo door to let air in to get rid of some of the smell. I will never forget that smell. It was the worst that I had or ever will smell. And these were the American bodies. Thank you. Chapter six, Memories of Corporal Michael Sears. My friend killed, March 6, 1968, on Hill 861, by Willie James Ferguson, E-4-0311 Infantry, United States Marine Corps, Keishon Hill 861, Vietnam, January the 9th, 1968, June 11, 1968. Good evening. Good evening. Many memories, but some stands out more than others. Corporal Michael Sears 
was up on the line look, on the, looking out. We had been friends for a long time. He was from New York two weeks prior to that date. He had become a proud father of a baby boy. We celebrated under heavy fire one night when he got the word that he was a new father. On this day, he had witnessed my situation and the incident with me and the platoon sergeant and the squad leader. He jumped out of his position and said to me, Willie, you take the watch. I'll go down in your place. Take the watch and keep a lookout. 10 to 15 minutes passed, and all of a sudden, we were the recipients of incoming hostile fire. Boom, 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 was being shelled from the other hill located in front of us. Mortars landed down in the area where the Marines and my friend was working. My friend was hit. I saw a cloud of dust stirring up in the sky, and I saw an E-2, uh, the shovel, uh, toiling off in the air like a baton, like one the cheerleaders would twirl. I heard the men down below yelling, screaming for help. I yelled, medic up, medic up, as loud as I could. My heart was pounding out of control. Everything seemed to have been moving in slow motion. My thoughts were about what just happened. What if I had gone down there instead of Sears? I had to go and help bring them up at heel and get medical attention. There was, they were wounded. My friend Sear was seriously wounded. Under fire support, we fought to get them quickly back up the hill. The conditions were slippery in the hill. Bob wire didn't make the job any easier. Sears was semi-conscious in a lot of pain. I tried talking to him. I also felt guilty about being somewhat responsible for what had just happened. He had a son and a wife. Not knowing if he was going to make it was worrisome. I could see that he was in bad shape. He had gotten hit with scrap metal all over his entire body. He was going in and out of consciousness. Medics were talking to him, trying to keep him awake, and we fought to get him up the hill and to the trenches out of harm's way. We called an air vac. For some unknown reason, we didn't get it. I was feeling that I was the cause of all of it. Doc did everything he could to keep him alive, but he died one hour, 15 minutes later. I watched him, helpless as he changed colors. He first turned pale and cold as the blood ran out of him. I felt sad and angry, responsible, helpless and guilty. I wanted to pray, but the words wouldn't come. Each night as his body lay on the LZ, I would look up and think about all the times we had laughed together, made jokes, and shared life stories. There are times when I'm alone and I get the flashback, the memories about our, my friend and some of the Vietnam action that we were involved in. And during these times, my heart starts to pound and I see the E2 and the battlefield dust and the smoke all over again. I see myself looking down at my friend and, and telling him that he's going to be all right. You're going to be all right, I said over and over. I can still visualize the body bag, opening it up and seeing him land in it. The war within continues. Thank you. Chapter 10, <clears throat> Greenfield Flashbacks Mission and Line Mines by Charles Henry Green, E-4, Infantry, 11 Bravo, United States Army, Benoit, Vietnam, February 1970, December 1970. I entered the war at a very crucial time in my life when black soldiers was fighting the war on two fronts, in America and in Vietnam. The way I looked at it at the time, Vietnam hadn't done a thing to me. America had done the most harm in my life. So I'm going to take a look. I'm, I'm going to read. Uh, 
the John Wayne illusion to you. This will be a little lighter than the other ones you've been listening to so far. The thing that surprised me most of all during my military experience was the John Wayne syndrome. I had expected the white soldiers to fight like the Duke. But it didn't take long for me to realize that Vietnam was not Dodge City, but more like the Alamo. I had planned to keep a low profile stand behind those brave white soldiers and to not be risking my life, position myself out front. This is something that I kind of dreamt up when I was in Vietnam. I kind of came to the conclusion that the white boys was more braver than the black boys, and they would stand out front and fight and wouldn't be ducking and hiding. But soon I found out that they were the same as me. They was lifting their weapon up, firing their weapon in the air, bursting two and three clips at a time, and did not know what they were shooting at. So let's just give you some rundown of what was happening. The first five fight I engaged in, I could see that Vietnam was not television, but the white soldiers had received the message seemingly before I did. They would hug the ground and put their weapons up in the air while firing a clip and hoping they hit something. From that experience, I learned to embrace the soldiers that I was fighting with as brothers or dear friends. I was fighting to save his life, and he was fighting to save my life. These were clear and visible objectives. When I first responded to my platoon, no, I'm sorry, when I first reported to my platoon, I was told by the sergeant that he didn't want me to walk point because every time a new black soldier came into the platoon, he would end up walking point in a few days. He thought that point men needed proper training to do it right. I agree. <laughs> Later, when I was asked to walk point, I made it clear to my lieutenant and platoon sergeant that I was not going to walk point. In any turn, they threatened me by saying that I was going to be court martial when we returned to the rear. I pointed out that I was a PFC, untrained for point man, and that I was not qualified for that position. I asked them to justify moving me from the rear or the platoon ahead of uh, and passing the point man assistant. I was not happy with the position that I was being forced to take, but I felt the need to take and stand up for myself and my life. They agreed that I shouldn't walk point, and I was, wasn't court martial. Mm hmm, that's true. Another time that I felt the need to disobey a direct order was on a day in which I was walking point, and we arrived at a point where uh, a point where we was going to enter a grassy area, and that was more than six feet high. Sergeant Chancy asked me to get out a formation and spread out to assault the grass for the enemy. <laughs> my, my response to the sergeant was that this was not a good idea to enter the grass and spread out a formation. Once I agreed, I was threatened with a court martial or uh, an Article 15 for disobeying an order. The sergeant supervisor got together with him, and after careful consideration, the order was changed, and we moved on out in a single file. The Army manual stated that a unit only spread it out when its members have vision with each other and can uh, remain on line. This is because if you are in the uh, jungle and the grass is higher than you, you cannot see the man walking next to you. So it doesn't make sense for you to spread out on both sides 
and you got a point man. The point man is the person that leads you. You should follow him, not that you should spread out in tall grass and kill each other. So actually, I was doing them a favor, I think. <laughs> I'm going to uh, end this now. In basic training, I received excellent military training with small arms. In training, I soon realized that I could pull the trigger of my weapon with ease and hit target with perfection repeatedly. The reason I throw that in was because, it's OK, Bobby? <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> the reason I throw that in because that was a point when I was, when I first got in Vietnam, I could pull that trigger just like that. And could, you know, I felt like I was ready to do damage. And then I reached a point where I couldn't pull the trigger. And I felt like it was dangerous for me and the fellow guys I was with. And I'm going to explain that to you, folks. It's OK, Bobby, right? Thank you. OK, what happened was I went through a period where I could not pull the trigger because they moved me from the rear to the front a little too fast. And when I got to the front, I, had to, I was in a position where I had to see everything for the guys behind me that was walking down, walking over trees and stumps and tall grass and uh, destroying the foliage there. Uh, you see, you got to understand. I'm getting away, Bobby. You got to understand that uh, <laughs> in Vietnam, a lot of soldiers would walk over trees instead of walking around them. <laughs> and uh, my theory was I walked through the grass very cautiously. It's like the wind is blowing. Thank you very much. Bobby, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Well, we got a lot of stories to tell, but <clears throat> we, we want to wrap, keep it moving here. Um, surviving the Vietnam ambush zone by Willie Brinson, E-5, 11 Bravo, 25th Infantry, United States Army, Playco, Central Highland, Vietnam, 1965-1966. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Charles talked about walk, walking point. Walking point was probably the most stressful position that you could take on search and destroyers operations. I meant you had to use every sense that you had, your sight, your smell, hearing, everything. And when you're walking point, like you said, the entire company is on you. And when I was in Vietnam, we would not put a new guy who just came from the States walking point unless he had been in at least about three or four battles where he knew what to expect. And when I walked point, I would just say, well, God, my life is in your hand. But anyways, I'm gonna, when, we, when I was in Vietnam, when most of us, 90% of us was in Vietnam, you got to understand, we was only 18 years old. And there were 11 guys in my squad, and uh, all of us was 18, right out of high school. In fact, my lieutenant, he was only 21. So we were very young kids. <clears throat> I was stationed in Hawaii with B Company, 2nd Battalion, 3rd Training Brigade, with the 25th Infantry Division. The 3rd Brigade, my, my brigade, we were deployed to the Central Highlands to a city called Play Coup. Now in the Central Highlands, it was very mountainous. And where we was at, we didn't fight guerrillas. We fought North Vietnamese soldiers. North Vietnamese soldiers were soldiers who was highly trained, had gone to a basic training. He wore a khaki uniform, red star. He was highly intelligent, spoke very good English. And when you got in a battle with them, they fought you to their last man is dead. <clears throat> On one mission, I was walking point, going through a cornfield. The corn stalks was about three feet high. While walking, we came under intense gunfire. Bullets was going 
around us everywhere. The corn stalks was falling on us from being shredded by bullets. We survived the ambush and killed a couple of North Vietnamese soldiers. However, our platoon leader <coughs> received a serious wound, was seriously wounded, and was evacuated by medevac. We never saw him again. Sergeant Johnson, my squad leader, became a platoon leader, and Sergeant Crookamp replaced a lieutenant. On another mission, PFC Brandon, that was my very close friend, he was from St. Louis, <clears throat> he was walking point, and our unit was ambushed. Fortunately, we recovered quickly and overcame the ambush, the hostile fire, and killed three North Vietnamese enemy soldiers. The others got away. Two men, Sergeant Bochamp and Sergeant Fourth Class Young, were seriously wounded. <clears throat> Some of the young guys who were crazy, they wanted to cut the ears off the North Vietnamese soldiers, but they were stopped. And you got to think, when we was in battles, uh, we did a lot of crazy things. So, but we, sometimes we became sensitive to what we was doing and didn't do this. But what they wanted to do, just cut the guys, the North Vietnamese soldiers' ears off for of souvenirs. <laughs> okay, on another mission, <clears throat> my platoon, the third platoon was flanked with C Company out of right flank on a wedge type formation searching for North Vietnamese soldiers. Captain Woods of C Company wanted a mountain checked out with HE, high explosive with white phosphorus, prior to our units going into that area. What Captain Woods failed to realize was that on his map where he wanted the HE coordinates high explosive launch, we were already at that location. So when he requested high explosive, the artillery unit, which was 30 miles in the rear, confirmed HE was already on the way. And we could hear the massive trajectory coming. Unfortunately, the missile hit the command post of Charlie Company, killing 50 US soldiers, wounding several others. The impact threw us off our feet. Our M-16 rifles was knocked out of our hands from the concussion-type forces. Soldiers were screaming, yelling, crying for medics and morphine. There was not enough medical supplies or morphine to help all the wounded. It was a very sad, unfortunate, traumatic, depressed day. The search and destroy mission was stopped. We were ordered to recover the bodies and body parts and return to base camp. Uh, General William C. Westmoreland flew out and stop the uh, search and destroy mission, and we went to base camp. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, um, Willie Brinson did receive two Purple Hearts, and he got a, he got a real story to tell. And, and quickly, on, on one of his, something that he didn't share with you all, he was wounded seriously and in the hospital and they was about to amputate his leg and there was one doctor that said no don't don't do that we're going to try to save that leg and they did <clears throat> medic warriors charles james second lieutenant medic united states army q chi saigon play cool narang fang Long Bend, Cameron, Vietnam, 1966-1967, January 1970. Good evening. Uh, I must not have done a good job the first time because I had to go twice, but that's okay. Uh, I'm just going to read a small portion real quick for you. Uh, I was a medical administrator, which means I had all the medical and dental records for the, uh, for the unit, the 25th Division, the same unit that uh, Willie was in. He was up in the north, I was in the south. Uh, we were located in a town called Kuchi. Uh, it's a town located about 25 miles uh, north of uh, Saigon, uh, near the Cambodian border. And some of the heaviest fighting in Vietnam occurred in that area. On one search and destroy mission, a tank carrying soldiers was hit by enemy fire. 
the soldiers closed the hatch of the tank and called for a medic who was about 25 yards away. Of my 30 medics, 10 were conscientious objectors, which means they did not carry weapons to perform their duties. Danny Willanueva was one of them. He began crawling toward the tank and was hit by, that was, and was hit by enemy fire in the leg uh, as he approached the tank. As he began beating on the tank uh, for the soldiers to let him in so he could render aid, he was shot again and knocked off the tank and lost his glasses. Although he was wounded twice, he eventually located his glasses and gained entry to the tank where he found uh, two soldiers dead and two wounded. He patched up the wounded uh, soldiers and uh, called for the medevac to come and uh, pick them up. For this brave act of heroism, he was awarded the Silver Star for bravery in combat. Because he never carried a weapon, his act of bravery uh, made one feel good about being a fellow soldier and a proud American. Thank you. We'd like <clears throat> to uh, thank you all for listening to our stories. And we ask that you all do purchase our book as a fundraiser for our post. Our post is right here at 4414 Pembroke Road. And Joy is in the back for those who want to purchase the book. I believe the soft back covers are $20 per book. And uh, we want to thank the city of Hollywood for inviting us here. And Anthony, thank you very much for accommodating us and putting all this nice video stuff and music up around here. And finally, I want to thank our commander, uh, Mr. William Frazier. Uh, he, he leads our pack, 600. And <clears throat> Thank you very much. <clears throat> What's the name of that book, Mr. White? Post 8195, Black Soldiers Tell Their Vietnam Stories. Freedom ain't never free. Well, thank you. Okay, our plan was to move this podium. I don't think we're going to go through it. We're going to start the panel discussion from here. And I'm going to introduce to you Dr. Glenn Bowen, who's going to moderate for us during the panel discussion. Here's your opportunity to ask these vets all the questions you want to know. <clears throat> you want to know, they have willingly said they will answer everything. <laughs> Is that not correct? <laughs> <laughs> I, I would like to thank uh, Commissioner Biederman for joining us. That's Commissioner Kevin Biederman. Before I hand the mic over, I'd like to recognize the, the chair of the African American Advisory Council, Dr. Mary Mice Campbell. Before I hand the mic over. And can I ask one question before I turn it over, Mr. Moderator? I, I got a question for Mr. Jam, James, and how is it he went to Texas Southern, thereby losing the fantastic education that was available <laughs> at Prairie View a and University? <laughs> There's no answer for it. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Grisby. Uh, Commissioner, distinguished guests, Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Good evening. So wonderful to see all of you here this evening. And as we sat and listened to the Vietnam stories, I'm sure we all were at some stage a little bit heart-wrenched, a little bit sad. But also we were, our spirits were lifted by the fact that we have had these brave men who have served and have told their stories in a way that is gripping, that is insightful, that is powerful. And so we thank Bobby and his team for their presentation, reflecting on the book that they've written. Well, we have a panel here, and 
because you've heard from some of the co-authors, what I'd like to do is to give the others a chance to say just a little bit. And as you ask your questions later, we can dig into some details of what their own stories are, what they have to share, given the theme of Black History Month, which is African Americans in wartime. And so I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Bert Stewart, who served in the U.S. Army. She, she gave more than 20 years of active and reserve service through the Army, and she's a decorated war veteran. And so let's hear from Dr. Bert Stewart. Just a little bit about your experience. Hello, thank you all um, for being here. It's an absolute pleasure for me to be here and share my story with you all. And I am in awe of the gentleman that I get to sit next to and hear the stories of um, black men and black women that have gone before me. Um, and I can honestly say paved the way for um, young black women such as myself to serve uh, in the US military. Um, I have had the distinction, some could say pleasure, some could say something else, I'll call it distinction of serving during Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm um, in 1990, 91, I believe it is. Uh, I have to be very honest with you, I have not talked about the experience. I don't talk about the experience. I don't know if it's because of intentional repression, um, remembering. Um, I don't know if it's because of seeing the dead bodies. I don't know if it's because the bomb that landed right next to me um, at the donut shop that we used to go to every day. Um, I don't know. I don't. I really don't know why. I just don't engage. I don't. Um, I don't talk about it. I remember it like it was yesterday. I remember it like it was yesterday. I remember waking up and traveling through cities and at nine o'clock in the morning, it would be pitch dark outside because the Iraqis set all the oil wells on fire. Um, I can remember times when we would be convoying from, um, convoying from um, Saudi into Kuwait or headed towards Iraq and we would come past an area, we would come through a city where there was battle before we had gotten there and there would be um, uh, large um, ammunition on the ground next to truck, there would be dead bodies sitting in trucks. S some cases I, there would be roses left in the corpse of bodies. Um, there were, would be bodies laying across the fields. Um, so just hearing probably a little of what I've said here may give you a glimpse of why I don't talk about it or why I don't share the story. Um, I can remember laying in bed one evening and all you heard, you know how you, you, how you go to the baseball games and they say bombs bursting over air? Yeah, literally bombs <laughs> were bursting. And I remember uh, laying down in a bunk, uh, a, makeshift, um, a makeshift facility for us when we arrived in uh, Saudi Arabia. And I remember being fully dressed, weapon on, and all of a sudden, I woke up screaming because Iraq had sent a bomb over. We had intercepted it with, uh, with one of our scuds and the shrap metal had come down on the building that I was in. And so <laughs> I, I didn't think I would make it. Um, I didn't think that I would make it out of I didn't think I would make it out of war. I, I signed up for the U.S. military, and I always say then, like I, and I still say it today, I didn't sign up for war. I never in my wildest dreams imagined I would go to war. I never in my wildest dream imagined I would go to war. But you went to war, and you have survived, and we're glad to see you this evening here. <laughs> Arthur Wells, we'll take some questions shortly, but
But Arthur Wells, you were also in Iraq, weren't you? I was, uh, yeah, in Iraq and in Vietnam. And also in Vietnam, you were right. a sergeant major and um, I was a sergeant major in the Army and I was a sergeant in the Marine Corps. Okay, so right, Mr. Well. Hello. Okay. <laughs> uh, I went into the Marine Corps. Basically, I went to Catholic school. So because I went to Catholic school, John F. Kennedy was kind of special. And he said something about, ask not what you could do, what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And that sort of like messed me up. I made a decision. When he got killed, I was still in high school. But when he died, I made a decision right then that I was going to go into the service. My dad told me, don't go in the Marine Corps. Because he had been in the Marine Corps. He came home with a steel plate in his head. My mom, she was in the WAC. She was, uh, she was a nurse. My sister was in the Air Force. My brother was in the Army. Well, I went to Vietnam, 18 years old, and President Johnson came out and said goodbye to us in a hangar out at Camp Pendleton. And he told us we would only be there six months. And they had this camera crew that left with us. We got on the plane. We landed in Da Nang. And they told us to go through hangar number one. We went through hangar number one, and they sent the uh, news people and the photographers to hangar number two. We all got split up, put on trucks, and sent out to different units. The people in hangar number two, they had already been over there six months, and they were getting ready to come home in six months, so they had them with them. It was a trick. We were not coming home in six months. Anyway, while I was over there, one of the things that really got to me was when you're in war and you're the only son, you're not supposed to be there, OK? I had twins in my unit, two brothers, exact twins. You could hardly tell them apart. One was out on patrol. One was on, the, uh, on guard duty up in a the tower. They brought his brother back dead, and they were carried him in the gate, and he could see it from the tower. He took his rifle, and he started shooting at us inside the compound. The colonel said, take him out. Take him out. Now both brothers are dead. The one that died was supposed to go back home the next day. He never made it. The other one died from us taking him out. It's strange. But to me, after the war was even stranger. Coming home and landing in El Toro Bay, California, Near Berkeley College, where kids was calling us baby killers and, and all kinds of vile stuff. We had to change clothes in the airport, in the bathroom, put on civilian clothes so they wouldn't attack us and call us names and stuff. Big difference when I went to Iraq and come home to a parade and all kinds of uh, you know, we didn't get any kind of counseling when we came back from Vietnam. But now, I spent two weeks coming back from Iraq where they sit and told me about my benefits and my medical and everything else that I had coming and what I could do and where to go for jobs. When we came home from Vietnam, we had nothing. They snuck us home. We went home and we tried to apply for jobs. They were still calling us baby killers and dope addicts. So we got to the point where we would not even write down that we were in Vietnam. We applied for jobs. We got jobs. We didn't talk about it. We hid it. We hid it. We hid it. You know, I was doing all right. I would join, I went, I went join the uh, National Guard, and I also worked for the Miami VA for 31 years. 
But I ended up spending 38 years, 39 years and eight months, total military service. And I tell you, Iraq was nothing like Vietnam. A lot of people died from friendly fire because the Army was not talking to the Marines, the Marines wasn't talking to the Navy, the Navy wasn't talking to the Army. But when I went to Iraq, it was well organized. We all talked to each other. You didn't call in for airstrike and the Marines got hit because it was all coordinated. We were all talking to each other for the first time. But my thanks, because I went to Vietnam and Iraq and didn't get a scratch. I thank St. Philip's Catholic Church in Opelika for their prayers for taking me and bringing me back unscratched. But all wounds are not physical. Okay, I have my nightmares too. Thank you. All wounds are not physical. Now we're going to hear from Dr. Sheila Chamberlain. She has a particular distinction because she was the U.S. Army's first African-American combat intelligence aviator. The very first aviator, combat intelligence aviator, African-American woman. We're proud of her. She served in Panama and Grenada, and she's going to share a little bit of her experience with us. How about that? Can you hear me? Well, uh, first of all, glory be to God that we're all here today. Um, at 7 o'clock, they aired a story on me on CBS4. So my phone has been blowing up because I'm here with you. And I'm honored that they did that. <laughs> my uh, road is different. I'm a military brat. My family can be traced back all the way to the Civil War. Everybody, every generation in my family has served in the military. And right now, my nephew is in, is in Afghanistan for his fourth tour. And his son is at West Point getting ready. So we come from a family of service to this country, our country. And everybody up here served. And nobody could tell their story but them. And nobody can tell me what happened with me. Now, you don't see that many women up here. So I've had to fight, not just by my race, but by my sex, my gender, who I am. There's plenty of scars. And publicly, I want to say, me too. Now, when I first came in the military, because I went to Fort Knox High School, yeah, Goldfinger, yeah, that one. I wanted to, to be a pilot because they showed women pilots in that movie, Goldfinger. You know, it started down here at Eden Rock Hotel, Goldfinger. Plus, I have two cousins who are original Tuskegee Airmen. Two. My biggest hero was my father, who served three tours of Vietnam. He left us in Germany, so we didn't grow up over in this country. We grew up in post-Nazi Germany. I believe my old mom, my old pa, were, they were survivors of the Holocaust. I was in Berlin with my mother when the Berlin Wall went up. So a little different, and I'm related to Emmett Till. So the humility of my father, putting that in us, to be humble and you still serve your country. 
Now, I was a super spook. I wanted to be like Harriet Tubman. The reason why we have reconnaissance now is because of Harriet Tubman and his still to this day. Anybody who was able to take slaves without missing one and coming back, but she never got credit for it. But a lot of what we do is based on what she did. So I became a super spook. And let me tell you, back then, you didn't have flights going to Korea. You had to go over there on the C-141. And I, that was my first tour, because that was my father's first tour in the Korean War. And I got off of that C-141. You know how rough that is. And said, Lieutenant, Lieutenant Chamberlain, yeah. Here, here's your 45. Get your ass in the car. Excuse my butt. Excuse me for saying that. Get, get in the car. They're burning the American Cultural Center in Kwanju. There's your 45. That was my first tour. They had completely almost destroyed everything. And back then, Korea was swamp. Do you understand me shooting right off the plane, fresh? I had three such tours after that. I didn't have the luxury of being a pilot. See, if you got pregnant, they kicked you out then. It's so good that now you can get pregnant and have children and have a family. I didn't have that luxury. And to sit there in the combat zones, you hear me with your peers, I couldn't sleep. You got your own peers looking at you, wanting to do things to you. You know what I'm talking about. Yet I was over the weather because I was the pilot of the unit. You see, Army Aviation didn't become a branch until 83 when they put everything together, which made me be the first. I was already doing all of this already. Those were called combat missions. But because it was against the law, I would see my comrades get their combat badges, get those things. Me, they had to put hazardous duty. Same mission, same thing. Oh, Jim, your family's here. Go ahead to your family. Lieutenant, you get over here. You stay up. You, you're all the alerts. Make sure everything is done. I didn't have that luxury. All of those missions went to Central and South America. On my efficiency reports, they have to put she was in forward, because you couldn't put that. When Ronald Reagan was saying we didn't have women in combat in Central and South America, this one was there doing it. Plenty of scars. And the smell of dead bodies still linger. Well, you will never forget that smell, ever. And what's more degrading was people telling you you weren't there here it is. So from the beginning, I didn't mean to get teary. I didn't come here for this today. But I didn't mean to get teary about it. But I served. I did it. I'm here. From the minute I got off that plane, there's been mission after mission after combat mission after mission after mission. The women today are now able to get those silver stars, to get those awards. And today, I'm proud to be here with you all here, because finally today, the people of my hometown, I'm sitting in my hometown before you to tell this story. Sorry to be emotional, but thank you very much. You've earned the right to be emotional. Amen. William Fraser, you have seen action in Panama. That's the Operation Just Cause. And you have been in Desert Storm and Desert Shield in the Persian Gulf. One of your key roles was as helicopter crew chief. 
And as you respond, will you tell us a little bit about your role as an operation, as the helicopter crew chief, as well as the work you did as combat door gunner? I think those are interesting roles that I think we would benefit from hearing about. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first, I want to say, at our post, we have a wall. And on that wall is pictures of a gentleman in here and some ladies who are wearing a hat like mine or similar to mine. And I call the room that those pictures are in the Hall of Heroes and Legends. You've listened to their stories tonight. Now you know why we call it the Hall of Heroes and Legends. When I went into the Army, my intent was to be an aviator. I was sold a dream, and I did everything I could to fulfill that dream. I would never even think that being on the same level as a Tuskegee Airman, a member of the US Army Air Corps distinction, the fighter pilots from World War II was attainable. However, many like people of my color have done that. When I left home, I left home for one reason. My father said, if I'm paying for you to go to college, you're going to be what I tell you to be. He wanted me to be a civil engineer, noble profession. I said, Dad, I'm going to the Army. Why did I say that? <laughs> so once I got there, yeah, it was an interesting road, I tell you that much. Once I got there, uh, I enlisted. And I enlisted for the position of helicopter crew chief. And they were going to teach me how to work on helicopters. And then they were going to teach me how to fly them. That was a part of the dream. But then comes a couple of other things. If you notice that from Vietnam until Operation Just Calls, there's about a 20 year, almost a 20 year gap. Do you know how much programming you can do of a person's mind in 20 years? And let me tell you, the United States military does a good job of it. We have been so without battle for so long, everybody in my era wanted to be like the people sitting to my left and right. We lived slept, ate, drank, the thought of combat, going to war, getting that combat patch. Once I get that combat patch on my right sleeve, I'm never getting out, and I'm going to look forward to the next fight. That's good programming right there. So as a helicopter crew chief, all you do is train. You train as you fight. You learn everything about your craft. You learn how to support the troops on the ground. You take them there, you drop them off. When it's time for them to parachute in, you're the one that gives them the go. Some of y'all up here remember how it goes. Stand in the door. <laughs> go, go, go. And before you could blink, they're gone. And you told them to do it. And you're like, oh, wow. I just made people jump out of a perfectly good airplane. <laughs> Think about that. So you're getting that power rush, and you're, you know, you're like euphoric almost. Yeah, yeah. Because even today in Army aviation, there's not a lot of men of color. We're still the minority. We're still the uh, scarcity. And when you see us walking on post, and you see one of us in a flight suit, the distinction of wearing that versus the camouflage and the BDUs and whatnot, it says. He done did something. And it's a certain amount of respect that comes to it. So as you progress in your career, you learn the difference between peacetime and wartime. What no one told me in peacetime was that if we do go to war, you're no longer a crew chief. You're going to sit back there behind the M60 machine gun, and you're going to shoot everything that moves until it no longer moves. No questions asked. And I strongly suggest you be proficient at it. The life expectancy of a crew chief door gunner in Vietnam was less than seven seconds. They didn't tell me that going in either. So 
going into uh, our first combat, <laughs> our first combat deployment at a place like Fort Bragg. Mind you, at this point, I'm all of 22 years old. I had already made sergeant in just a little over four years, and uh, <laughs> in charge of men and machinery. Who would have thunk? So I had already done overseas tours and landed at Fort Bragg, and we do all kinds of training missions under the 18th Airborne Corps and the old 82nd. The only, the only problem is that they never tell you that it's training. Every mission is like the real thing. You tear down those helicopters, you push them on those planes, and you better be ready wherever that plane lands to get them out, get them running, get them in the air, machine guns mounted, ready to fly. So first deployment, Operation uh, Just Cause, Panama. It was our first major conflict since Vietnam uh, disregarding Grenada. We knew that this mission was different. When they took us in for the briefing, they had the red lights for us. They wanted you to start getting your eyes adjusted because we do everything at night. Then we went into another room and there was dog tag checks. Everybody got your dog tag tags. You couldn't move without them. The bag that you were told, your go bag that you had with you. Take everything out that you don't even think that you'll need. Go into the last room, which sealed the deal for me. They made us take off our boots and they took our feet print. And the purpose of taking our feet print is that when a helicopter crashes or is shot down, if you can get the boots, you did good. So going in right there, I knew this was a different type of thing. I remember the battalion commander to this day looking at us in the eye saying, when you get off that plane, your head had better be on a swivel. And we're like eating it up. Yeah, yeah, OK, finally, yeah, yeah. So we make it over to Pope Air Force Base. And we load up on this uh, 141. And we're looking at each other and we're saying, you know, we're on this plane. We're looking at all these other soldiers. They got their rifles. They got their ammo. But we're aviators. We got these 45s. That's it. 45s. And then. Even more stunning, no one gave us ammo. So we look at each other and be like, hey, didn't they give y'all ammo before we got? No, we didn't get no ammo. We thought they gave it to you. No, they didn't give me no ammo. You get it? No, I didn't get no ammo. OK, so all we got is the one clip that's in our 45. The rest of the ammo for the M16, the bullet's too big. They won't fit. Every group has one. I ain't going to say nut job. I'll say one eccentric member who always has extra ammunition for no good reason. <laughs> so because of him, we were, all, we were able to get the full clip that we got, one more clip, and some extra bullets for our pocket. So we're, uh, the thing about Panama is that it was, a, it was a staged war. This is one of the few wars that we got to plan and have practice runs and all this other good stuff because we worked close with Noriega in the drug war in the early days, as he was one of our operatives to come find later. And our barracks, the troops in Panama actually lived in the same barracks with the Panama troops. So how do you attack a country without killing your own soldiers if they're living in the same barracks? So when the order comes down that we're going to do the invasion and go get Noriega out of there, we sent all of our troops to the field. Regular two-week field training drill. The Panamanians were none the wiser. So that's what we did. So we get on this 141. We're flying. We get past the ammo issue, going in on approach. Then you start hitting those, hearing those bullets hitting off the side of that aircraft. It's a sound that you never forget. We go in for the first landing. The fire is just too heavy. Pilot does a go around. We go in for the second try. You can still hear, but guess what? They don't have enough fuel to do another go around and get back to where they got to go. So it's now or never. 
never is not an option. So he brings it in, hits down. The rest of the troops, this is where the brotherhood comes in at. The rest of the troops knew that all we had was our small arms. So they said to us, when we go off, it's regular infantry. We're gonna do the formation around the plane, lay down, enemy, lay down fire against the enemy so that the plane could get out of here. Y'all stay behind us. I wasn't intending to stay behind anybody. <laughs> but nonetheless, I attached myself to one of those uh, infantrymen and something that my drill sergeant, who was a door gunner before me, said to me before I left. He said, an aviator without an aircraft is nothing but an infantryman. Because the minute you hit the ground, you better know everything that they know if you plan on surviving. And if you don't, you better be in one arm hip pocket. So I got into a hip pocket. We went off that aircraft, and he shot one direction, and I shot er the other direction. I even changed the clip, and he said, oh, you know what to do with that thing. I said, I've done this before. So we laid down that fire. The 141 leaves out of there. We got to get up, uh, regroup, get a head count on everybody. We went to our helicopters. Helicopters were already in place because we had an Air Force base there mounted the M60 machine guns, and we started flying sortie. Non-stop, around the clock. In addition to having to fly them, we had to train the other soldiers that were there as to what to do. It's one thing when you're on your squad and your point man that you've been friends with goes down, it's something that you'll never forget. But when you take a soldier and you train him from nothing to what he's supposed to do, and you know when his flight comes back late that something's not right because you couldn't reach the, any of them on the radio, time goes by two hours, three hours, four hours, then you get word that three helicopters punched in the triple canopy and they're not coming back. Them jungle guys know what triple canopy is. Jungle three layers deep. So you never forget things like that. When you're in a different environment like the Gulf, perhaps me and the Sergeant Major could probably uh, say that we, uh, we've experienced the two extremes of, of the business that we were in at that time because that's all that war is, it's a business. There, we consider no worse warfare than jungle warfare. They have snakes that call, they call two steps. They bite you, you take two steps, and you're dead. Fortunately, they didn't run into any of them. The second most uh, treacherous environment is sand in the desert. And the doctor, she mentioned how bad it was when the cloud of black oil was being burned by the Iraqis. It was pretty bad. I was flying in it. It was pretty bad. Bad enough to where when we went to land at a remote post, we couldn't see the man-made runway. There was no place to refuel. All we could do is race tracks and try to get lower and lower so we could see the ground. That was one of the crew chief's job and door gunner's job is to call out the ground to the pilot. There's nothing to call out, sir. I can't see anything. We could be on the ground now for all I know. So we're going in, you get a reflection off of the clouds of the anti-collision light, the strobe that's going on. The pilot on the controls, he's looking at this reflection and he gets vertigo. Mm -hmm. Aircraft jerks to the left. We are literally out of control. Fortunately, the, the co-pilot was a seasoned and seasoned, seasoned chief warrant officer for he was able to recover the aircraft before we did a complete left roll. So we continue to try to land. We're, we're insanely low on fuel at this point. Uh, we came up with the idea, get the motor sergeant, have him put deuce and a half at the end of the runway 
and beginning of the runway with the high beams on. Maybe we could see them. Final go around, all that we could see was a flicker. We can only assume that's what we wanted and where we wanted to go. We go in for this landing. Finally, we're able to see some ground. I called out to the pilot on the controls. Sir, I think it's 20 feet. Continue descent, 15, 12, 10, boom, ground. When the aircraft came to a stop, the front rotor blade was as close as I'm sitting to that wall of one of the trucks. Only by the grace of God were we able to avoid another catastrophe there. Warfare is a lot, of, a lot of psychological things. When you're in a place like the desert, that's nothing but sand, and you wake up in your tent, and all of a sudden your tent is flooded. Where did that come from? So as you go through all your different trials and experiences and whatnot, you just keep putting them away. You forget about things like when you fly to a forward zone, you get off, the guy who gets off next to you steps on a toe popper and starts screaming. And you realize as you look at him, if you had stepped one step to the left, it would have been you. I never thought that I had any uh, PTSD. I, I live in denial. <laughs> and I'm not talking about the river. I live in denial on it. it, it it came to fruition one day, I should say one night, I was uh, in Los Angeles and I was driving. They have red light cameras there. This is when they were just coming out. So I'm going through this uh, intersection, I'm, you know, I'm pushing it. And the camera flash comes off and it looked just like muzzle fire, muzzle fire coming at you. And I jerked the steering wheel and in that intersection I did a th complete 360 <laughs> complete 360-degree turn there, and I wondered what the heck just happened. And as I sat there, I realized what happened. I just had my first flashback of an event that had happened. So, so those are some of the things that you'll encounter as a crew chief and door gunner. Thank you so much. Loretta Young, you have lived a life of service. In fact, um, when you were in West Philly, um, in high school, in fact, in your senior year, you were a volunteer with the Philly VA Hospital. And uh, you did a tour of duty in the US Air Force. And since you retired 20 years ago, you have still been actively involved in so many areas in our community, in our society. In thanking you for your service, we ask you to just share with us some of your experiences. Thank you, and good evening, everyone. I first, I first want to thank uh, Bobby White, uh, because Bobby has included me in this program this evening, and I'm actually the only one here on the panel that has not seen combat action. Uh, so to be brief, but just to give you a little bit of my background, uh, at 17, in 1958, I graduated from high school, West Philadelphia High School. We all have our dreams and we all have our stories. And my dream, my life, uh, my ambition was to be a nurse. I studied for 12 years and I was a straight A student. I graduated number 11 out of 300 from West Philadelphia High School. They were giving out scholarships for nursing and I knew I had one because I worked so hard. When those scholarships were given out, my name was never called. Loretta Young never got an application, never got that scholarship. I was very naive, I was very puzzled, and I went home and I asked my mom, what happened? I've been studying all these years, why was I a straight A student? Why I just concentrated on going to school and being a nurse and I didn't get that scholarship? And she said, well, you know, that does happen. You know, you're a woman of color, so that's a good reason there. Those scholarships went to someone. They didn't go to you. 
So at the same time, we had the recruiters come to our school and speak with the students. And the Air Force recruiter said, you're a very ideal candidate to go into the United States Air Force. And I said, well, I hadn't thought about that because my ambition is to be a nurse. Well, go in the military, go in the Air Force, and you can be a nurse. And I said, well, I'll try. So I took my exam, passed with flying colors. Only 17, I w had to wait till I was 18 years old to go in because they wouldn't take women at 17. So I went to New Jersey and I waited a year, waited for my class, and I went in at 18. And of course, when they give out your assignments first, they ask you, what do you want to do? Well, number one, I want to be a nurse. Number two, I want flying. Number three, I want crypto. Okay, here you are, a secretary. What? <laughs> That's the last thing I wanted to do. My mom was a secretary. That's what she did her whole life. That's why I studied so hard. I wanted to be something different. I wanted to be more than just a secretary. But it didn't happen. I think the great creator has all of our lives under his care. Uh, because that was the beginning in 59 when I went in. They were just starting the Vietnam War. A lot of people didn't even realize it, that we were fighting over in Vietnam or in Cambodia. Uh, but there was fighting there. Uh, I did not get that position as the nurse. I went in and I was a secretary. Also at that time, I did one, one tour of duty, and as was mentioned earlier, women weren't allowed to have families. Well, I had gotten married, and of course the family came along. So what happened? Well, I was given my discharge. So I had my one tour, but I was discharged, but I loved aviation, I loved the Air Force. So actually, as far as my retirement is concerned, my next best step was with the airlines. So I had 31 years with American Airlines, and that's my story there, and it took me 50 years when I went to my 50th reunion at West Philadelphia High School, and met one of the young ladies there, and she said, Loretta, what happened to you after school? And I told her, and she said, uh, well, gosh, everybody, we just wonder what happened to you. You disappeared, and we thought you had a career. And I said, well, I wanted to be a nurse. And she said, well, they had those nursing uh, scholarships. I said, yeah, I know. She said, well, I got one. And I said, what? You were a B student. <laughs> she said, yes. She says, and you know, it was so hard. I was only there three months, and I had to quit. So life is a journey. Thank you. All right, now we'd like to get some questions from you, and any comments you want to make, this is the time for it. Um, Anthony is gonna assist me on this side, and if you indicate, yes, we'll indicate um, on this side also. Um, let's take your hands up, we'll see where you are. Mine is just, hello? Okay, mine is just quick. Um, the B student, she was Caucasian. Yes, she was. Okay, I just wanted to clarify. <laughs> Question. Uh, to the panel, if you was to do it again, would you have ch chosen that path? The way it turned out, yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, the other one is, is uh, oh, no, she says for the panel. Yeah. Well, yeah. for everybody, yeah. for the panel? Yeah. 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 Would I have done it this way? You, you, you never know what the Lord's going to send you through. But uh, personally, I would have done it differently, of course. I would have had a family and children and everything else. Okay. So, uh, I didn't get to do those things, so. Okay, and the young lady over there seems very young, so <laughs> you Dr. couldn't. Bert Stewart. You couldn't have retired a long time. Um, I have a son that um, was in military for 20 years. He retired two years ago, and he came home. He had two um, trips to Iraq, and. I don't understand why y'all not allowed to tell your stories. Now y'all retire, you can tell your story. But he can't tell his story. He comes back home with PTSD. 
instead of talking to family, he has to go to therapy mm -hmm. to talk about. So we don't even know. I listened to your story about the trucks. He was in that situation. The truck that was in front of him yeah. blew up into pieces. And his truck was just behind. So he was saved from that. So thank God he came home alive. But it's very hard for him now because he retired and he spent more time doing therapy to PS P I have to PTSD <coughs> than he can live a normal life. He's distant from his family, from his wife, from his children. And it's make me afraid because now my baby son, he's thinking about going in the military. And listening to you all make me think now to say, no, if you could help it, unless they summon you to go, don't go. Let me, uh, <coughs> let me, let me answer some of that, please, if I may. Sure. <coughs> First of all, my background is, uh, as you heard earlier, I served in Vietnam. And um, I also worked for the Department of Veterans Affairs for 32 years as a mental health counselor, psychology. And I counseled thousands of veterans over that period of time, <clears throat> most of them who had PTSD. The Vietnam veterans during that time, as you heard, they swept a lot of their PTSD up under the rug. You heard, you heard the lady here say that she didn't want to talk about her PTSD. It's important that you talk about PTSD. Therapy groups are very good, <clears throat> very good groups. Your son is doing the right thing by going to a therapy group to go back to his traumatic experiences so that he can put that in perspective. It has to be put in perspective. You have to talk about those traumas. To bury those traumas inside of yourself is leading to a lot of destructive behavior. <clears throat> so your son is doing the right thing. But, if, but the point about post-traumatic stress is that therapy, group support, individual family therapy, it all works. I've seen it work in my 32 years as a counselor. So I got to tell you that. Now the military, <clears throat> you ask that question, will we do it again? Some of us would, some of us do it differently. But for most of these people up here on the stage, it worked out halfway okay. Halfway okay. So I got to say that. I'd like to, to share something really quick if I may. So I want to clarify, I have never been diagnosed with PTSD. Um, um, which, which don't necessarily mean I don't. My family would tell you I'm just naturally crazy, so <laughs> that could go, to, go, could go either way. But one of the things that, that I would say to you is, as you are asking the question, why don't we talk about it, um, I don't know why we don't talk about it. And so we go get other therapies, don't know. But one of the things that I certainly can encourage you to do, and, and particularly because your youngest, youngest son is thinking about it, is the families learn more about the, about the, the PTSD and how to interact with us, you know, or someone that has it. How to, you know, how to better, better uh, prepare yourselves for engaging an individual that has PTSD, because it is two-part. I did, I don't have anyone in my family. I'm actually the first in my family to go, a large family to go into the military. But my girlfriend, good girlfriend, she came back early with PTSD. And I still look at her today almost, for her almost 20 years later, and it all just seems so mental and psychological. That's just me and looking at it from the outside. Um, and so I had to go as a, as a BFF and just better learn and understand how do I engage Brenda? You know, how do I, you know, not trigger her, you know, but still try to help her, you know, to be strong and to live a normal life. So one of the things that I definitely would say is, is that the family, you know, could do to learn more about what it is and how it really impacts him and what families should do to, to better um, prepare and uh, help. Thank you very much. Um, was it hard for you guys in the war? Yes. Oh, go ahead. Was it hard for you guys in the war? Who would like to expand on that? Just a little bit, just a little bit. Let, let, me, let me just say one thing about that. First, let me say, it's important that you know that there are services in your community for PTSD. Our VFW Military Outreach Center has those services here in this community. 
We had 4414. We got a nice facility for veterans to come in and talk about their PTSD. Tuesday night is Vietnam. Wednesday night is substance abuse. Thursday night is OIF, OAF, Operation Enduring Freedom, Operation Iraqi Freedom, Persian Gulf Veterans on Thursday night. We are connected with Noble University and some of the other universities in reference to PTSD and all the studies that goes along with that. So we have a community support base here along with the VA. The VA supports our center for the VFW. The city of Hollywood has funded us for our center. So there are resources. Now, the young fellow over there said something a few minutes ago. Was it hard for you? Yes, it was extremely hard. It was tough. It really was. A lot of us lost our minds out there. But we had to pull those pieces back together. The other thing is important. When you serve your country, your country has to serve you. Most of these veterans who have PTSD is compensatable. They got to pay you for that loss of limb and loss of mindset. A lot of our guys are living on their disability checks because some of them can't work, some of them can't think the way they used to, but the government has to pay for that damage. And we fight for that in Congress with the VFW, the American Legion, and the DAV. We fight for those benefits for all our veterans who serve this country. Thank you. Um, um, what did you eat when you were hungry? <laughs> <laughs> okay, someone should take that question. MRE. C rations. C rations. Yeah, C rations, man. Let me let me explain, just explain C rations to you. C rations. Oh yeah, they changed the MRE. Yeah. Uh, C rations were uh, a, a little, little coming a little cardboard box about uh, what maybe three inches by eight inches inside that little inside that little container with a little little can of uh, uh, maybe pork and beans and and wieners. Uh, Maybe uh, uh, two of the fish. Uh, maybe uh, spaghetti. Uh, then you had a little pack in there with three cigarettes. You had uh, maybe little, maybe a little, little small container uh, that had maybe a little bread in there. Uh, but it was a meal. And, and, and we, it was a meal. You get full. It was a meal. Uh, 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 matter of fact, you get so used to eating it uh, that you don't want to eat a regular meal. A regular meal <laughs> gave me <you> dysentery. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, and 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 and, and our, our meals uh, our, our meals was was from uh, uh, from World War II. That's that's how long those meals had lasted. Okay, wow. they, they, they was they, they was from World War II, but they was great meals. Yeah, I, I want to um, first of all I want to congratulate you. You're doing a fine job. And I answered the C ration. I want to say one thing about it that I remember clearly. They had something in a small can. C ration, I think it was corned beef. Or yeah. Beef. No, mm -hmm. you can always, you can also use that as a weapon too. Were any of you born in a time of segregation? If you were, was it hard? Go ahead. Yeah, you start. Okay, we're going to ask her to repeat the question. We want to make sure everyone answers. Everyone hears. I'm sorry. Repeat. Let's go again. Were any of you born in the time of segregation? And if you were, was it hard? Yeah. yeah. Uh, let me, let me uh, give you a little short story of that. I come from a little small town outside of Houston, Texas. And uh, after I finished my degree, I was commuting back to Texas Southern. It was about 35 miles away. And when I had to do an assignment, uh, I couldn't do it with my commuters, but I couldn't use the library in my hometown. So I had to get the librarian from my, from my high, old high school to get the books. And so one day I just decided I need too many books to have her to go there three or four times. So I went to the library, uh, followed by the sheriff and the, uh, the mayor and some other people from that town. And to this day, that library is open for everybody. Wow. Okay. Could you, could you expand, expand on that, though? Because I wanted to get to that. The, during that period of time, when there was segregation, what impact did that have on you in the military during wartime? How did that dynamic play out? Well, well, let me say this, just say this. When I uh, came back from Vietnam, segregation was still segregation. 
We went to, me and a white friend of mine, we went to Virginia Beach. And we tried to get a room together just for the weekend because we left from the base. And he went and they saw me standing there and they wouldn't give him a room. We went on the other side of town and I tried to get a room and they wouldn't give us a room. So it was going both ways where it was segregated. So what we finally figured out, I'll stay in the car, you go get the room, and then you let me in later. <laughs> and I'm serious, that's how bad it was. It, it was crazy. This was in 1967, 68. Yes, and also. And when I came home and joined the National Guard in 1975, you know that lake, that hole in the middle of the state of Florida? I went up there, and we stopped at Lake Okeechobee. A bunch of us in military vehicles, military uniforms, and we went to a restaurant and tried to get something to eat, and they told us to come to the back door. And I'm saying, in uniform, I don't have fought for this country, you telling me to go to the back door? He called the police on us and had us escorted out of Lake Okeechobee. <laughs> I don't, know no, a, I don't know if it's a question or observation. Um, this gentleman said he disobeyed order because they asked him was to do something and he didn't do it. But they told him before that they are not going to put anyone in the position that they put, they put him if they are not trained and he wasn't trained for that position. That's an observation. All right, thanks for your observation. We'll take a question here, then we'll take two here, and we're going to be wrapping up in about five minutes, okay? okay. Thank you. Is this on? Okay, I want to say, uh, as a son of a Korean War combat veteran who also suffered from PT PTSD, and it affected our entire family, I want to thank all of you for your service on behalf of our country in the different branches that you serve. Here's my question. Having grown up in Houston, Texas, my mother attended Texas Southern, <coughs> and that was the same place, if I'm not mistaken, that Muhammad Ali refused induction into the military for Vietnam. My question to you who served during Vietnam is, what effect, if any, did the black power movement have on you when you were serving over in the Vietnam War? Uh, I just want to say this. In Vietnam, I saw a unity among blacks that I thought would uh, filter back here in the States, but it didn't. Uh, but I discovered why. We were isolated. When in isolation, uh, if you've noticed, every, every uh, uh, immigrant that comes to this country, they band together. And they do better when they band together. Uh, We've been in this country for so long, from the time of slavery, that we've been scattered. But in Vietnam, uh, we, 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 were, we was confronted from two sides. Uh, we was discriminated back home, didn't have your freedom back home, but we went, we was going, went to another country to fight for their freedom. And, and over there, we was fighting discrimination, uh, even amongst, in, in our ranks, uh, Americans, okay? So I saw a unity there that I just, I just knew would, would, would filtrate back to the states, but it never happened because when we got back here, we what we was spread out again. Uh, and veterans, uh, when we came back, you know, um, there was a lot of people that hadn't gone to war, and we didn't feel comfortable about talking to anybody. It took us what 35, 40 years to get to a veterans group where we your story was my story. Uh, and the young and the young lady asked about her son. He doesn't talk to the family. None of us did up until three years ago. Uh, because what? You wouldn't have understood. Daddy didn't understand. Sister didn't understand. Wife wouldn't have understood. Okay, it took another veteran who's been through what you've been through, okay, to understand. Uh, uh, that's how we wrote the book. It was time we opened up because what? We're close to death now. We've ever been before. And it's time we shared the story. <laughs> Somebody need to know our history. Amen. Thank you very much. Can I, can I say something to add? Sure, sure, I, sure. Uh, because, uh, and I have to go back to the uh, PTSD um, having also, my father was a Korean War vet, three tours of Vietnam, and all of my brothers, by the way. 
two are remaining alive. Purple Heart. Um, you know, I, I suffer from PTSD. It's taken me quite a long time for me to even sitting up here because they've called me a recluse because you don't talk about it. And I think I did a pretty good job trying to deviate talk about it today myself. And it's part, it's what you do. I got, it's, you get triggered. Yeah. I mean, I'm listening and I'm, I'm sitting here. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to think about it. And I'm looking at these young children right here. You know, so holding back is very difficult. And you can't go home. You can't be with your mother. You can't be, your father knows, be, you know, that experience. Your brothers. You can't sit down with your nieces or your nephews to talk about it. You can't. You don't want to talk about it. You don't want to remember. And it may take some time, but now they have help now. Right. And I'm listening to the other doctor. See those doctors? Earned. I went to University of School of Miami Law School as well. My first year there, because I got out of the service, you know, right after the Gulf War, 1993, I went before Congress to testify why women need to fly combat missions, because I was already doing it. Do you understand? And after that, I was out August the 1st. I was in law school here August 7th. And I could not, I had a hard time, because then it all hit me. It hit me hard. My first year of law school, and I had some good professors who had been in Vietnam, combat helicopter pilots. By the way, a combat intelligence aviator, people go, what is that? That, who, who flew those guys in? to get bin Laden. You don't hear about them, do you? The folks that flew them in, that's what a combat intelligence aviator is. We don't talk about it. This is a newer generation. They have books and, you know, the video and all that. Who, who can I talk to that about? Who can I sit and have a conversation about that with? So I just wanted to say to you, it may take a while, but they also have classes for the family now. They didn't have that when I was growing up. That man will tell you too. You look at Shaquille O'Neal's dad. Shaquille, there's a lot of brats like us. You know, Missy Elliott, Martin Lawrence. You wonder why he lost it. So I just wanted to express that to you. Uh, it, you know, and, and in serving my country, we go all the way back. Somebody's got to do it. And everybody doesn't have that DNA in them to do that. I'm proud to say I got that DNA. Thank you. Get back up. First of all, I want to thank you all for serving and coming and thank you for your son. And, oh, I'm sorry. And I want to know uh, after this is over, could they sign our book? Would they sign our book? Thanks for your question. We'll oh. Okay, we're going to go very, very quickly. So, yes, no, we're going, to, we're going to hear from you. One moment. Keep it, keep it short there. We're going to keep it short here as well so we can wrap it up, okay? So, okay. here we go. So, so, my question is, my, my kids are in Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, and they participate in this thing called the Honor Flight. Yes. And what we were concerned about is that we didn't see any African Americans being honored. Most of them were World War II vets. And I was trying to find how would I be able to support the veterans who are African American to get that honor flight before they leave this earth. Okay, I, I can answer that because I'm a member of, uh, member of Honor Flight South Florida, and you're absolutely right. We just, uh, I, I was on the last flight to Washington, D.C. in September 23rd. That was, uh, that was uh, 72 Vietnam veterans, 72 Korean and, um, and World War II veterans. And it was two African Americans in the whole group. I was one. I was the other. So we are, are desperately looking for all World War II veterans and career. And it's very easy. You go on uh, on a flight to South Florida, and you register, and uh, that's how you get that's how you get involved. 
Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. I, I just want to say to you all, it's an honor to be in a room with you all. A complete honor. Thank you for sharing that. Most, most importantly, though, I think just the fact that you've gone through the things that you've gone through and you share the stories that you've gone through, and I think that everyone here, whether they've served or not, who has dealt with any psychological issues, physical issues, things that they've gone through, like the sister up here, share, therapy, write, do the things that is necessary for you to get those things out of your system, get those demons out, because they have shared with us stories that hopefully will help the young people and the old people alike get through their challenges, but I salute you all for sharing with us. Thank you very much. Sure. Hello, good evening. Um, first of all, thank you all very much for your service. I am the daughter of a veteran, and my question to you is, how do you hold on to your humanity and your love for, for human humankind after being in a position where you were ordered to take the lives of others. Um, I'm wondering, do you hold any animosity or, or um, resentment to the people you were fighting, um, uh, trying to stay alive yourselves? Do you hold any of that? Or are you able to see them as human beings that you were just you know, order to to eliminate. Let me let me let me let me see if I can respond to that. <clears throat> there was a time, and 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 I'm, and I'm sure all of us had some training before we went into the war that we should sort of dehumanize our enemy. We used to call them Charlies and Dinks and Gooks and all those kind of names, so that we can kill them. But. You heard a little bit of my story about how that changed. Now, what I'm saying is we suffer that guilt. We do. It's part of the PTSD. Guilt. Feeling guilty is part of it. Even though we did it in the name of serving our country. But the guilt is part of PTSD. It's one of the characteristics that belong to PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. So what we have to do is to forgive ourselves. The spiritual part of it is, is a part of the therapeutic process, too. Yes. Talking therapy is a part, of the, a part of the process. Trying to put all those pieces in a different perspective and trying to accept that change. I mean, all of this is therapeutically that has to be explored and, 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 and done with some professional person who understands how to put those mechanics back together. But it's not easy. Before we wrote our book, our guys, they, they, they shared their guilt. They shared their flashbacks, their nightmares, their daymares, their anxiety, their numbing, their alcoholism, their drug abuse. They shared all of that, but none of them do that no more. They have a group on Tuesday night, and our group love to be there. Every 25 of us in there strong every night, every Tuesday pack at the VFW. So I've seen it happen when I was working for the government in therapy sessions. But that's a good question. But it is, it's not easy. It's hard. Tears, laughter, anger, all the emotions has to come. But I got to say this now. There's a higher consciousness that you got to plug into. That's it. I got it. one shout out too before. Uh, just this one shout out for the for the children who are in there and the parents at the main Broward Library. They have the Tuskegee Airmen exhibit, soaring. I just wanted to say that also because that's that, for sharing that. Dr. So Jim. for the kids to go and see that for the A two quick months. question for Doctor um, for from Miss Young. Racially profiled in the war. How were you racially profiled during the war? Were you? They First just course. looked at you. <laughs> <laughs> they just stared at you, you know. That's, 
<laughs> okay, final question. Okay, uh, I have a question to all of you members of the panel and anyone who's a veteran over here. In my opinion, all the wars that the United States has been involved in are inexcusable, okay? Uh, besides World War II where we were attacked. All the other wars, we've been attacking other people and I'm very well aware of all the wars that in my life, in living here in the United States, we've been involved in like over 40 wars. You talk about uh, uh, Panama, uh, the other country that you mentioned, uh, Grenada. Most people don't even know about Grenada. And, all the, and I remember the atrocities that were being committed against the Vietnamese people and so on. I know a lot of story. But my question is, and again, I, I remember when Muhammad Ali said, you know, I'm not going there. No Vietnamese ever called me a nigger. And I respect him so much for that. And he was willing to give up everything because he had principles. Now, my question is, for a country that has done you so much harm for so many years, for hundreds of years, and we don't have to go into the details, it's been awful, and it still goes on today, why, why the hell would you want to go and, and risk your life to fight for something that they're making you believe that you're fighting for the country? I mean, you're not. And I hate to say that maybe some of you will, will disagree with me and so on, but I'm telling you what I know, and if I were black, I would definitely not risk my life for this country. Okay. Uh, question, I mean, uh, uh, my own point of view, uh, I, I was going before I got drafted. I was going to go in the military anyway, uh, and and all that you just talked about was part of the reason I want. I felt like I need to go into the military, cause I said once I put on that uniform and I go fight for this country, nobody is going to call me a nigga, going to call me a black American. I am an American. Okay, uh, I, 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 to myself, I felt like I would be, I felt like that I had to do it for myself because when I left here, that was nothing for me. It seemed like the military was my only way out. Okay, and, when I, and, and trust me, when I came back, I came back to the rights of August 18, 1968. I left Charleston, South Carolina, half paralyzed left side of my body to try to keep me from, not, from going home to re recover for the 30 days after you come back in country. Uh, but I said, no, I got to go home because the National Guard was uh, uh, on 63rd Street and I lived on 64th Street, 10th Avenue. Uh, they was all up and down uh, uh, 62nd Street from 7th Avenue down to, uh, I think it was 17th, 18th Avenue. I saw tanks riding up and down my street. I, the same stuff I just left Vietnam. That, uh, we, we fight other people, it's on my street. And I put on my uniform. See, you hear a lot of guys say they 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 they, they, they was told no, no. I wore my uniform home. I wore my uniform home, and I wore it up on 62nd Street. And I was saying, burn it down, because if you burn it down, you got to build me something new. I'm an American. I want all my rights, and I can tell you, and I'm in my lifetime up till now, I didn't let nothing stop getting my way of me. Uh, the only thing that was between me and where I wanted to go was the air that was between me and where I wanted to go. I, just like I, I went 11,000 miles away from home to fight for somebody else's freedom, I come on to fight for my own. I didn't let nothing get in my way. And I have accomplished all that I intend to accomplish. And so if, for this country, yes I would. This is a beautiful country. You do, you, in spite of its, in, in spite of all that goes on, America is a beautiful country. There's none like it. And it's worth fighting for. And that's a positive note on which it's to worth end. fighting for. And so we want to thank. Let me thank Loretta Young. <laughs> William Fraser. Dr. Sheila Chamberlain. Arthur Wells. Willie Ferguson. In his absence, he had to leave early. Um, earlier, Dr. Um, I'm sorry, William Brinson. And Robert Bobby White. Charles Jay. Charles Jay. Oh, Charles.
That's because he went to Texas Southern <laughs> instead of Prairie View <laughs> and became unnoted. <laughs> Mr. Bowen. February the 22nd, we'll be back in this room for the second annual Poetry Slam contest. We need your help in telling your friends can so we, we can do